Good morning, we continue with our uh, lecture on cinema and modernism. We have already uh, discussed some of them like uh, Sergei Einstein, Deja Vartov and we will be looking at a couple of uh, more modernists, the pioneers. So, uh, you can take down the list, one is Fritz Lang, F. W. Marno, Jean Renoir, Jacques Tati, Max Offels, the filmmaker who directed Lola Montes. Ma Max Offels uh, is also the name uh, of a character in a Salman Rushdie novel. You know, Rajdeh himself is a big aficionado of cinema, old cinema. Anyone remembers which novel? Do we have one Max Ophels novel by Salman Rajdi? Shalimar the Clown. Okay. Robert Bresson or Robert Bresson is a French name. Louis Bunel and of course, uh, the Japanese masters Ozu and Kurosawa. So, these are the modernists. Um, we will start with uh, discussing Fritz Lang and Marno and uh, some other significant German filmmakers as well. So, uh, German expressionism, which was a very important movement, some of us have already done that before, so, but let me just take you quickly through it. So, after Germany's defeat in the first world war, um, uh, the artistic form of journal, uh, German expressionism captured the mood of the uh, generation of that particular generation. Germany had lost land and its people and also been uh, uh, very badly humiliated in the Versailles treaty. There was a collective or general feeling of paranoia and morbid morbidity among the German people and uh, cinema UFA, the principal film studio in Germany, whose job was to promote avant-garde cinema. UFA is Universum Film uh, Academy and it supported the endeavors of filmmakers like Robert Huyen, F. W. Murnau and Fritz Lang. So, these are the pioneers and they uh, employed the device of expressionism in cinema. Expressionism, which was already uh, an artistic movement, it began with uh, uh, seminal paintings, it was also employed in dra various dramas and theatres, performances and then soon it found its way in cinema also. Though some of you must be familiar with the famous painting Scream by Edward Munch. Yes. Okay. So, um, an important film of this, which uh, employed this device was The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari by Robert Huyen. It is a narrative of a mad doctor, a scientist who uses a somnambulist to commit crimes for him, a sleepwalker to commit crimes for him. It is a 1919 film. And uh, some other movies which employed expressionism were uh, Nosferatu, The Last Laugh and Fritz Lang's Metropolis, also Fritz Lang's M. It is often said that modern cinema begins with F. W. Murnau. Along with uh, Fritz Lang and uh, Willem Pabst, we were talking about Pandora's box yesterday, Willem Pabst. Murnau's films are full of dread and suggest a world between reality and fantasy. Murnau was also a closet homosexual and his films uh, in some way reflect his uh, uh, that reality as well, the themes of repression and sexuality. He was also a master of creating an alternative universe uh, and therefore, he, 
expressionism was God's answer to all his prayers, because he believed in creating and representing an alternative universe on, in, on screen. So, Marno, his most famous horror film is Nosferatu, a symphony of terror, where the protagonist uh, plays a Count Orlock, a Dracula like character. In fact, uh, Murnau was inspired by Bram Stoker's novel Dracula, but he had to rename the film Nosferatu and he had to, he wanted to tell the same story, but he could not because he received legal threats from Bram Stoker's uh, heirs. So, he was forced to make uh, some modifications, some changes, but the basic story remains the same. Fritz Lang, another major German director and his films are characterized by psychological terror, paranoia, morbidity and dread. And so if uh, you are familiar with a movie called M, are you? Yes, you are Ranjit. How many of you are familiar with M? Okay, please do watch it, make include it in your list of compulsive, compulsory watching, compulsory viewing, M and Metropolis especially. What is M all about? You have watched it. Uh, yeah, yeah, he is a child killer, he is uh, the, the protagonist is an anti-hero, he is a, he's a child killer as well as a pedophile, he lures children uh, with a certain kind of, a, yeah, yeah, he gives them gifts, he lures them with gifts, balloons, chocolates and there is a, a whistling tune that he often plays. Exactly, yeah. So, uh, but um, and uh, the entire story is about this gr group of very ordinary citizens looking out, uh, looking for this person, okay, this mysterious enigmatic killer and it turns out to be a very ordinary, very regular man next door kind of a person. He is not a villain who works in groups or uh, he has a big den or something. He is just a person who could be lurking round the shadows, lurking round the corner in a shadow. Okay. So, that is the dread, that is the atmosphere of dread, the danger lurks around corners. Okay. No one is safe anymore, is that kind of a society we live in. And when people, the ordinary people nab him and try to take law in their hands, they want to kill him. Of course, he has killed so many children raped children, so why not. And then he breaks into this justification that he has been taken over by forces of darkness and then he gives um, uh, vent to his rep repressions and to his paranoias. So, um, it is a very strange movie where the villain is uh, given a platform to give expression to what happens to a person who can turn to a crime of that nature. Um, we will talk about uh, a French master, Jacques Tati. He was a silent comedian who worked as a mime artist when young. And uh, with the advent of sound, as we have been talking about what sound did to many people and Charlie Chaplin anyway never bothered and never thought much of speeches and dialogues in cinema. So, uh, many people saw the, the end of their careers with the advent of sound, but uh, um, uh, so even, Cha but later on Chaplin succumbed to it, he had to use dialogue. Tati, however, carried on to that with the tradition till the 50s with some success. So, Jacques Tati. Tati's first major film as an actor was Holiday, where he plays a simple postman on his small bike in the countryside. And then, Mr. Hulot's Holiday in 1953, it tells the story of Mr. Hulot as played by Jacques Tati and his vacations by the sea. So, uh, it is an episodic story, several hilarious incidents occur 
as our man takes his vacation. Uh, he arrives in his little car, meets a group of people, very you know uh, uh, stereotype characters, types, the, the, the blonde, a waiter, a general, okay, we know the type. Okay. And uh, uh, Hulot does not quite fit in, he is a misfit and bumbles through the setting. So, does he remind you of someone? Mr. Bean. Now, Mr. Bean's holiday, which was a fairly recent movie, 2007 I think, is based on it. It is a homage to Jacques Tati, the same old car, okay, all the antics, so, most of the time miming. If you, if you uh, observe Mr. Bean very closely, he does not speak too much. When he is doing his Mr. Bean, Rowan Atkinson, yes, okay, brilliant actor, but when he does Mr. Bean, there are rarely any dialogue, very few. Okay, so, uh, it is a very physical and uh, very surreal kind of a comedy that he believes in and Jacques Tati was his inspiration. Jean Renoir, we are going to do Renoir in some detail later on, but just get familiar with Renoir. So, he is uh, August Renoir's son, August Renoir the celebrated impressionist painter. And interestingly, uh, Jean Renoir's birth coincides with the birth of cinema. We have been talking about 1895 at the watershed period. Jean Renoir fought in the First World War, quickly returned to Paris and got into the film business. And there are several stories about Renoir's greatness. Um, if you read some, read up some material on him, then you will have understand how what an interesting character he was in real life. Um, he made several films and one of the earliest film was called The Southerner 1945 with a screenplay by the celebrated American novelist and screenwriter William Faulkner. Renoir made 40 films in all and he has had a far reaching influence on people like Truffaut, Orson Welles and Charlie Chaplin. Many regard him as the greatest director of all time. He was one of the most formidable influence on the French new wave, a nouvelle vogue. So, Jean Renoir, we will be talking about him late in uh, subsequent classes also. So, some of his important works include La Chien, the, the bitch, Boudot saved from drowning and a day in the country. He was a humanist and his films reflect that. So, the, you do not find any traces of snobbery, any arrogance in his cinema, but an affection through uh, towards all strata, all kind, all social strata, all kinds of people. And you find him, his cinema, a very large hearted, very open, very uh, uh, humanitarian kind of a cinema. His two masterpieces are La Grande Illusion, The Grand Illusion and La Regle de Jeu, Rules of the Game, okay, which is a classic, which is a masterpiece, 1939, The Rules of the Game. La Beth Human, that is the human animal, uh, is another important film by Renoir, 1938 which is based on a novel by Emile Zola, Emile Zola, the famous writer, naturalistic writer. And the idea is La Beth Human, the human and beast, that is there is an animal inside all human beings. No one is uh, an angel, nobody is a saint. Okay. There is a human, there is a beast that lurks beneath or inside all human beings, which comes out 
at unexpected moments, that is the idea. Emile Zola, he gave us the idea of La Bête Humaine and Renoir made a movie of it. The River is his first color film and it is interesting, it was set in India and Renoir was in India to shoot the film on the banks of uh, the river Ganges. And uh, perhaps you remember once I told you that Satyajit Ray, a young Satyajit Ray assisted him while Renoir was making the river and that is how Ray got interested in cinema and the, uh, the genre or uh, the class poetic realism. Jean Renoir was known for his cinema of poetic realism, like we have all these movements, expressionism, impressionism. So, Renoir was known as poetic realism for no and uh, um, Satyajit Ray, if you watch some of his earlier movies, they, uh, they show a distinct influence of Renoir. Another great French master, Max Ophels. did not live for too long, 1902 to 57, but one of the most stylized filmmakers. For him, style was the meaning, the way you do it. His first film was Laibile, about the ecstasy and agony of a young couple in love. And generally, he is considered an expert on doomed love and doomed love stories. So, uh, whatever little you have watched of, Mac, uh, of Lola Montes, perhaps that gives you some indication of what kind of filmmaker he was. So, no one ever uh, um, lived happily ever after in Ophels. People were always, but they loved grandly and they suffered greatly as well. Uh, he was a force to flee and then he arrived in Hollywood when France fell to the Nazis. So, he was a German who had, uh, who spent much of his life in France. After France was occupied, he had to leave and he came to, he arrived in Hollywood. And he made stylish melodramas for uh, Paramount Studio, The Exile, Letter from an Unknown Woman and The Reckless Moment, all classics and uh, all part of Hollywood cinematic history. Our uh, Martin Scorsese professes to be a huge fan of Max Ophels. And after the war, he returned to France and made four elegant classics. Lola Mantes, we just watched clippings from. The earrings of Madame De. Now, what is Madame De? Yes? An ellipsis, uh, Madame the, it's, that is the title of the movie, okay, the earrings of Madame the and the, uh, ellipsis. So, we do not know, we really do not know what her husband's name is. She is a Madame who is wooed by several admirers, okay. And the, the, the plot is quite hilarious, it is not actually a comedy, but then you see the, the, the human error. Okay, the human folly of passion in the movie. It is all about an aristocratic uh, madame who is uh, married to a very wealthy man and he gifts her with a pair of exquisite diamond earrings. So, a very interesting movie, La Ron, La Pleasure and of course, Lola Montes. So, uh, Lola Montes is Ophel's masterpiece is based on uh, a dancer, a 19th century dancer, who became the mistress of the pianist Franz Liszt and later of uh, Ludwig the first, the deposed king of Bavaria. And 
and she never has any luck with men. She gets, she repeatedly gets heartbroken and is dumped by them and ends up in a circus where Peter Rustinov is the ringmaster and she has to sell her life secrets to make a living and also kisses to people. So, in this is important and uh, Max Ophels is credited for uh, making voyeurism as an art. Okay, voyeur, I mean, uh, you just whatever brief clipping you just watched, you must have realized how she is displayed, displayed as an object. Okay, she is not considered a human being at all, right? Okay, she is just there as a farm fatal, as if it is an object okay, to leer at, to ridicule. So, an image presented for voyeuristic gaze. If you want to know more about voyeurism in cinema, then you should read um, the, uh, an essay by Laura Mulvey. Laura Mulvey, I will, we will be talking about voyeurism soon. Laura Mulvey who talks about cinematic gaze. And Lola Montes as presented by the ring master and uh, um, it is also a, a, a sort of meta cinema, you know meta cinema, cinema about cinema. So, Astina almost becomes an alter ego of the director Max Ophels and presents the actress to us. And how does he do it? the most sensa sensational act of the century, spectacle, emotion, action, history, adventure, a creature, a monster will answer the most indelicate questions, the most intimate questions, the most indiscreet questions. So, it is a way a director presents his work to the audience, so come watch it and ask me or criticize me any way you want to. And then of course, the pan style, you know, the camera panning all over the place. And while she sits motionless and emotionless, but then lot is going on in her mind. So, uh, Laura, uh, Lola Montes was filmed in Eastman color and in cinema scope. So, that is important. Those were big techniques those days, cinema scope and Eastman color. It was an extravaganza a very lavishly mounted film. And colors are often used very non naturalistically, especially when Laura is transported back in time and in flashback sequences, where ev every tint goes according to the tone of the episode. So, when she is extremely bright and happy and young, as you have seen her along with Liz the tone is very uh, bright, but later on it get, keeps getting darker and darker. So, Jean Cocteau, a poet, painter, sculptor, novelist and dramatist. So, Cocteau is also known for his plays, for his real multifaceted talent and also a great filmmaker. So, uh, some of his great movies, Blood of a Poet in 1930, Orpheus which is based on his own play 1950 and Beauty and the Beast which is commonly a children's fairy tale, but in Cocteau's hands it becomes something else. Okay, so, that is 1946, one of his most everlasting and most popular, most commercially successful film, Beauty and the Beast. Uh, an image from Beauty and the Beast. Now, you have hands holding the various candles, hands springing out of walls and curtains. Okay, this is the beast, the beast's castle. You all know the story, the legend uh, of uh, beauty, right? Beauty and the Beast. So, no explanation needed there. So, how she is compelled to lead her life with the beast 
and as she starts falling in love with him, why? Because she is able to see that beneath the surface there is a nice person. Okay. But um, uh, Cocteau's mastery was in creating the ambience. Now, in children's fairy tale, you wouldn't have so many arms springing out of nowhere. It gives a certain kind of a very surreal, very uh, unnatural kind of an image. But then the uh, uh, Cocteau's power was such that uh, the film, film became a major success and it was enjoyed both by adults as well as by children. Again, you can perhaps pay attention to the hands holding various candles, while beauty glides through the long corridors. This is Orpheus or the Orphe. So, in Beauty and the Beast 1946, Cocteau succeeded in creating, a, he was a master of imagery, the way he would create images on a screen. And very surprising, very unique kind of images of astonishing beauty, with beauty gliding along the corridors and not just walking, actually she glides along. Mirrors transforming into pools of water and candles lodged in humanoid arms affixed to the walls of the castle. So, you find all these astonishing images in the movie. And the great actor, French actor Jean Marais, he was the beast and Greta Garbo famously called out once the movie was over, give me back my beast. I mean, she was so enchanted, Greta Garbo, the famous star from Hollywood. Um, Cocteau was a contemporary of Bunel and Salvador Dali, both surrealists and in Cocteau you will find plenty of surrealistic images. Um, how many of you are familiar with a movie called Modigliani? Modigliani. Yeah? I haven't seen it, but heard of it. Andy Garcia. Okay, watch the movie. Watch the movie. It uh, transports you to that era where Modigliani and Picasso and Cocteau, they would all, you know, they were all each other's rivals. They live together, eat together, paint together, and fight um, uh, forever, you know, for recognition. Who is the best of all? So, watch the movie. It is not a very popular or not a hugely commercial movie produced by Andy Garcia, but a great movie nevertheless. Okay, um, this was also the period when films started. So, remember yesterday we started with the advent of cinema 1895, arrival of the train at the station, where workers leaving the Lumiere factory and now we are coming to color and cinema scope. So, in the early 50s when Hollywood faced severe or serious major competition from television, all the honchos put their heads together and tried to figure out what they should do to lure audience back to the theatres. And they felt that apart from the introduction of color, cinema scope will also help, because it will give you that you know, impression of a huge, hugeness, a big, big, uh, big screen exper uh, experience, which of course, television cannot do. So, cinema scope was devised by Henri Cretion and was purchased first by 20th century Fox a major studio. So, the technique involved using an anamorphic lens that which when mounted on an ordinary camera photographed images that were horizontally squeezed. So, this was the simplistically put that this was the uh, technique. And these images would be unsqueezed during projection and resulted in an image wider than the film frame. 
So, uh, fox chief 20th century, I mean I am not talking about chief of foxes, but 20th, the head of the studio called 20th century fox was Daryl Zenuk, a dreaded man. Many people hated him for a variety of things. And he watched the first two cinema scope production, the earliest examples of cinema scope. The Robe, starring who? Is based on Christ's life, but is starring who? No, Charleston Heston. I mean, I think that <laughs> that's what everyone believes. You think Ban Christ and Ben Hur and Ten Commandments and think Char Charleston Heston. The robe had the great Richard Burton. He's one of the generals. And how to marry a millionaire? She's a showgirl uh, and a model. She needs to wear thick glasses but she wants to marry a millionaire <laughs> okay <laughs> and so many a time you know the comedy arises because she has to take off her glasses and then she keeps on falling all over the place a beautiful film uh, saturated with colors sumptuously made and in cinema scope and then uh, following the success of the robe and how to marry a millionaire Fox announced that subsequently they will be making films only in cinema scope. In India, the technique came much later, okay, because af after all it was a very expensive technique and uh, required huge amount of expertise and expenses. So, the new fad caught on, although some filmmakers were not very happy with the way things were going on, but then Soon it went on to become one of the most important devices to influence cinema. Any questions here? Any comments? What kind of themes do you think uh, cinema scope is best suited for? Give me an example of a good cinema scope film that you have watched. You have not paid attention to it. Okay. Shole is one, one of the earliest films. Okay. Why do you think that Shole, a movie like Shole demands cinema scope version? Why does not Shole look the same on television? The locales. The locales okay. It is a movie with immense magnitude. Okay, so, all films which are epic in proportion, Gone with the Wind, Ten Commandments, Ar Shole or Mughal -e Azam, they require this technique. Okay, but it is a technique which is not suited definitely for more intimate kind of films. So, you think of the kind of filmmakers who would make films based on the lives of the middle class. Okay, think of someone. Let me test your knowledge of cinema. So, Shole is an epic movie, we all agree to that, too many characters, all larger than life kind of cinema, okay, that requires larger than life projection. But, a re more realistic kind of cinema comes more intimate, closer to life, it does not require that larger than life kind of representation. So, therefore, 35 mm. Yes, Rehan, you seem to be very reflective. Has a good angle to do with wide angle shots? Of course, yeah, but wide angle shots also uh, are best suited for a certain kind of cinema. You can't put use a wide angle anywhere in Smita Patil and Shabana Azmi kind of cinema. So, the parallel cinema hardly ever utilizes, it was not just about funds, it was also about the themes. A particular kind of theme, setting, locale. It requires cinema scope, it screams for cinema scope. Shole cannot be imagined without that particular sound and uh, uh, cinematography. Okay. Much of its value emanates from, the, from its technical expertise. 
many people are of the opinion that the plot is a lift from various sources, especially once upon a time in the West, Sergio Leone is. Okay. But Shole has been universally praised for its cinematography and its sound. So, a particular kind of cinema requires particular kind of scope and dimension and cinema scope is best suited for those, I mean Jodha Akbar definitely cannot be shown in a compact version, but Shanghai does it require necessarily, love sex and dhoka digitally shot, not really, you do not need that kind of a mammoth scope for such kind of cinema. Definitely, I mean we had Dibakar Banerjee with us talking about LSD shot on digital camera. It does not require that hugeness. Uh, 